Okay, um, shalom everyone. Uh, today we're doing thoughts on Vaikha. And um, I've called this one trying the hearts and the kidneys. Um, when we covered this Torah portion a couple of years ago, I went really quite in depth on it and um, I didn't want to repeat myself again this year. Uh, so I thought, let's look at some of the other things that maybe I would have wanted to cover a couple of years ago, but didn't really get the chance. Um, so without further ado, let's get stuck in. So the book of Leviticus is one of the least understood books in the scriptures. And I would argue that this occurs on both sides of the riverbank, actually. I mean, definitely on the Christian sides, um, because of dispensational mindset and just, you know, this division between Old and New Testament, um, people kind of think that the, this book is almost redundant. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of people that then go into sort of the Messianic Hebrew Roots movement, they bring all that baggage with them. And you see this, it's quite evident, you know, like one of the biggest um, things that you can see is people almost elevating the blood of animals to that of the blood of Messiah and vice versa. Um, and because people don't understand it, they, uh, you just lose a lot of things. Uh, you lose um, just a, a lot of nuances of the scripture. And we, we, there's actually bits in the Brit Hadashah that we don't fully get because there's actually sacrificial language. Uh, a lot of the New Testament authors um, spoke it, that they had this sacrificial language or temple service going on in the back of their mind. And especially in the Psalms and um, even the book of Revelation, if you don't understand the temple service and the tabernacle service, there'll be aspects in the book of Revelation that don't really make sense. Or it's one of them things you don't know what you don't know. Uh, the book of Leviticus, it teaches us the protocol of the tabernacle and of drawing near. So obviously we know that the tabernacle was, everything was to be done according to the pattern showed to Moshe. Um, and I've put here the protocol of drawing near. Um, the word for an offering is a korban, karban, and it literally means it means uh, it comes from the root word karav, which means to draw near. And the idea, this is something again that we lose in our modern mindset that when the king gave you an invite and you came near to the king, you weren't allowed to come empty-handed. Uh, you had to come and bring a gift. Now this should make us think of a couple of scriptures uh, when Yah says, when you come and present yourselves at the Moedim, you do not come empty-handed. Uh, this is like an ancient Near East, Near Eastern custom that they used to do. Um, the book of Leviticus teaches us holiness, how to be set apart. And again, because um, modern, modern theology has almost made this book quote-unquote redundant, um, you lose uh, the protocol of holiness. And, you know, again, Peter in his letter will say, he'll quote this, you know, saying uh, that Yah says, be set apart for he is set apart. Um, there's another verse that speaks of no one will see him without holiness. So if we throw out this book or in, in most people's cases, if we don't fully understand this book, we won't actually understand holiness properly. And if holiness is what teaches us how to draw near, and drawing near is what we want, it would behove us to understand how to do this. Now, this week's Torah portion covers the five different types of sacrifices that are to be offered. So you have the burnt offering, you have the grain offering, um, you have uh, the peace offering, and then there's two different sin offerings. Now, this is, this is something that people almost miss because they think that all the sacrifices were for sin, and actually only two of them were for sin. And the two sin offerings, uh, something I mentioned a couple of years ago, is that none of the sacrifices actually covered intentional rebellious sin. There were, it only covered um sins of omission like so you didn't realize you've done something and then you find out um so 
again, uh, people forget these things. And um, yeah. Now, when um, we did the teaching two years ago, I really went in depth uh, onto what all the different offerings were. So if you've got questions about, you know, the different type of offerings, I'd recommend you watching the Torah portion of uh, that we did two years ago. So Leviticus 3 verse 1. And if that which he presents is a slaughtering of peace offering. So now we're talking about the peace offerings. If he is bringing it of the herd, whether male or female, he brings a perfect one before Yah. And he shall lay his hand on the head of his offering and slay at the door of the tent of appointment. And the sons of Aharon, the priest, shall sprinkle the blood on the slaughter place all around. And from the slaughtering of peace offerings, he shall bring a fire offering to Yah, the fat that covers the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them by the loins, and the appendage on the liver, which he removes with the kidneys. So notice that these sections, we're going to read in a second, that the fat belongs to Yah. But it's when he's saying that the fat belongs to Yah, it's talking about all these things you know the fat on the entrails the uh, the two kidneys the fat that is on them by the loins and the appendage on the liver um th these are all included in the fat and the sons of aharon shall burn it on the slaughter place upon the ascending offering which is on the wood which is on the fire as an offering made by fire a sweet fragrance to yah and the two kidneys and the fat that is on them by the loins and the appendage on the liver, which he removes with the kidneys. And if the priest shall burn them on the slaughter place as food, an offering made by fire for a sweet fragrance, all the fat belongs to Yah. It is set apart to him. So again, the fat in includes all the kidneys and the appendage and so forth. Now, the same process applied to the peace offering if it was either a lamb or a goat. Uh, peace offerings could be lambs, goats, or bulls. Um, it was up to the person. Now, the peace offering was actually a free will offering. Um, now, if all these things belong to Elohim, i.e. the fat, the kidneys, the appendage, it would behove us to know what these things point to. Everything, the, the, the Levitical service is the physical, which points to a spiritual principle. So obviously, um, when I did, uh, I did a teaching, I think it's part six of the blood of Yeshua. And in that we, we cover, uh, it's, it's called something, why the blood of animals? Uh, and in that we, we looked at how the blood of animals is the physical representation of the heavenly and the heavenly is that of the blood of messiah and the blood of animals was for the cleansing of the physical flesh and the blood of messiah is for the conscience that the blood of animals could never do so let's find out what the kidneys uh, have to do obviously i've titled this presentation trying the hearts and kidneys so psalm uh, psalm 7 verse 8 Yah judges the peoples. Judge me, O Yah, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity within me. So notice he's, he's asking Yah to judge him according to the integrity that he's done. Please let the evil of the wrong be ended and establish the righteous. For the righteous Elohim is a trier of hearts and kidneys. Now notice that the heart and the kidneys are being almost put in the same bracket as it were and this is in the context of being judged and to be judged according to the integrity within uh, a person psalm 26 rule me rightly O yah for i have walked in my integrity and i have trusted in yah without wavering now imagine being able to say that and truly mean that, that you have walked in integrity and that not only have you trusted in Yah, you've done so without wavering. Examine me, O Yah, and prove me. Try my kidneys and my heart. So notice again, the, the kidneys and the heart are being lumped together and it's in the context of being proven, of being examined. And it's almost as if the, psalm, the psalmist is saying, examine me because I've walked in integrity. He, he can say that. For your loving commitment is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. 
I have not sat with the men of falsehood, nor do I enter with pretenders. I have hated the assembly of evildoers, and I do not sit with the wrong. I wash my hands in innocence. So again, the uh, David, in this case, he's able to say, Father, prove me, try my kidneys, see that I've been walking in integrity, see that I have done righteously. Jeremiah 17, the heart is crooked above all and desperately sick. Who shall know it? I, Yah, search the heart. I try the kidneys and give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. So again, this idea of searching the heart, the kidneys, that it's almost as if the heart and the kidneys are equated to the same thing. And it's always in the context of judgment, of right ruling. Now, it says that Yah does things, uh, he gives every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. So this kind of brings up this idea of why do you do what you do? You know, what, what, let, let's use the Torah as an example. Why do you keep Torah? Why do, do you use Torah as a form of self-elevation and self-arrogance and to smash it over the head, uh, over people's heads? Or do you do it because you love your creator? Because guess what? Yah searches the hearts. He tries the kidneys. He can see into the dark recesses of your heart and he'll pay you according to that. And th this is prefaced by the heart is crooked above all and desperately sick. Who shall know it? You know, um, people, people can do seemingly righteous things for all the wrong reasons. Why? Because our hearts are crooked. Our hearts are crooked. Revelation 2. And to the messenger of the assembly in Thyatira write, this says the son of Elohim who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like burnished brass. Now, notice that who's speaking, the son of Elohim, Yeshua is speaking. I know your works and love and service and belief in your endurance. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. But I hold against you that you allow that woman, Isabel, that's Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and lead my servants astray, to commit whoring and to eat food offered to idols. So th this uh, woman is leading people into spiritual adultery. And I gave her time to repent of a whoring and she did not repent. See, I am throwing her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great affliction, unless they repent of their works. And I shall slay her children with death, and all the assembly shall know that I am the one searching the kidneys and hearts. And I shall give to each one of you according to your works. So this is Yeshua saying this. Now, I just want to bring this up. Who was it in Jeremiah? The, look at the quote. I, Yah, search the heart. I try the kidneys. I give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Now fast forward to Revelation. Um, Yeshua is saying, the son of Elohim, I am the one searching the kidneys and hearts, and I shall give each one of you according to your works. It's literally almost a direct quote. So I find this really interesting. You, you've actually got um, uh, a, a hidden, as it were, divinity statement here from Yeshua. But notice the context again. Revelation 2 is all about, look, you, I know your works and love and service, but I hold all these things against you. He's proving them. He's, he's, he's able to peer right into the heart, into the kidneys, and he can judge what is driving their actions. You know, uh, it brings up the idea of, um, I think it's in one of the Psalms where he says that all, all things are laid bare before him. You know, when you stand before him, you, you're essentially naked. He can, like spiritually, I mean, he can see right through you. The kidneys are associated with the heart of man. Hebraically, the heart is the essence of man. And what I mean by that, it's, it's who makes you you. It's your emotions, this, your, your intellectual capacity, it's, it's you. And in the Hebraic mind, the heart and the kidneys are the same. The kidneys represent what's deep within the man. 
the, the part that only Elohim can see. And I've put a note here, what's behind the social mask? Look, all of us have a social mask. We go out, we go to the public, and you put on a persona. As You know, it, it's, it's you, but only those, you know, and those, for example, your friends know you're on a more intimate level. So they know things that the general public wouldn't. And then you go down to the level of marriage. My wife knows things about me that no other person does. She knows me on that intimate level. She sees, she sees the real me. But ultimately, all of us, even with, between husband and wife, there'll be that part of you that only Elohim can see. And sometimes Elohim will see things within you that even you can't see. I mean, what, th this is why we have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But what I want to show is that the kidneys represent what's behind that social mask. It's that bit that no one sees. And that's what Yah looks at. And that's how he judges you accordingly. So, again, now remember, the, 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 in the Levitical system, the kidneys are laid on the altar. Now, last time I checked, anything that's laid on the altar has to be sanctified. It has to be perfect. It has to be set apart. So... Are we in a position that we can actually lay our heart and kidneys on his altar? It, it's sobering. Psalm 139. Oh, Yah, you have searched me and know me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought from afar. You sift my path and my lying down and know well all my ways. Who feels like they've been sifted? recently especially leading up to unleavened bread right it, it but this is part of it why because he's searching us he, and sifting what does sifting do it separates it separates uh in in terms of the grain offering you would sift the flour so that what was left was fine flour for there is not a word on my tongue but see oh yeah you know it all where would i go from your spirit or where would i flee from your face if I go up into the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. I take the wings of the morning. I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. There too your hand would lead me and your right hand hold me. For you, you possessed my kidneys. You have covered me in my mother's womb. Like he, it's almost that he owns us. He possesses our hearts. He, he can hold it. He can see it for what it is. I give thanks to you, for I am awesomely and wondrously made. Wondrous are your works, and my being knows it well. But notice that he possesses the kidneys, and by that he possesses our innermost. He can see it all. And look how the psalmist is saying that it doesn't matter where I go. I could be in the heavens. I could be in Sheol. There you would be. It's truly a... A fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living Elohim. My bones were not concealed from you when I was shaped in a hidden place, knit together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body, and in your book all of them were written, the days when they were formed, while none was among them. I.e., he can see the end from the beginning. Search me, O El, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Now, whenever you see this idea of being tried, you need to have this idea of refinery, like metal being tried, as it were, so like uh, silver being uh, tr put through the furnace or gold put through the furnace. This is what it means when he says, try me, refine me. Now look, search me, O L, know my heart and try me and know my thoughts and see if an idolatrous way is in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Now, this is King David saying this. King David, he had a heart after Yah's own heart. He, looked, he read the Psalms. And read Psalm 119. He yearned and longed for the Torah of Yah. And he's saying, search me, try me, and see if there's an idolatrous way in him. Which beckons the question, do we have idolatrous ways in us? And that, uh, that's a yes. We all have idolatrous ways in us. And I'm not talking about bowing down to graven images. I'm talking about pride. You know, pride, pride is a form of idolatry. King me, 
I'll make myself my own Elohim. I'll sit on the throne. And David is saying, search me, know my heart, try my kidneys, see if there's an idolatrous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Psalm 73. Now, while I was putting this teaching together, um, I don't know about you guys, but when I was younger, I found the Psalms very almost distant from me. Uh, they felt like, th 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 to me, they were just songs and they never really fully opened up. And this Psalm, it just blew wide open in such a beautiful way for me this week. It was really amazing. And all of a sudden, this Psalm now is contemporary. Elohim is truly good to Yisrael, to those whose heart is clean to those whose kidneys are clean. Remember, kidneys and heart are equated to the same thing. So if you want Elohim to be good to you, you need to cleanse your heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boasters when I saw the peace of the wrongdoers. For death has no pangs for them, and their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, and they are not plagued like other men. So pride is their necklace, the garment of violence covers them. I mean, that passage right there is timeless. We can see that today. You know, you see all the crookedness and all the corruption and people, you know, um, gaining riches and all sorts through unrighteous means. Their eyes bulge from fatness. Their heart overflows with imaginations. Now, this brought up a couple of passages for me. In 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, i.e. though we are in a physical body, we do not fight according to the flesh. For the weapons we fight with are not fleshly, but mighty in Elohim for overthrowing strongholds and for overthrowing reasonings and every high matter that exalts itself against the knowledge of Elohim, taking captive every thought to make it obedient to the Messiah. Now remember, in, in the Hebraic thinking, they didn't think with their heads, they thought from their heart. So in Psalm 73, 7, when it says their heart overflows with imaginations, this is what, and Paul is saying, look guys, the weapons we have are for overthrowing the reasonings that come from our wicked hearts. We need to take every, cap every thought captive and make it obedient to Messiah and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is complete. It also made me think of Yeshua in Mark 7, verse 20, and he says, What comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the hearts of men, proceed evil reasonings, adultery. So think evil imaginations, evil reasonings, adulteries, whorings, murders, Thefts, greedy desires, wickedness, deceit, indecency, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. All these wicked matters come from within and defile a man. So going back to our psalm, you can see the psalmist is saying, look, why are these people that have wicked hearts and all their, their heart overflows with all these wicked imaginations, why are they being quote-unquote blessed? Why are they doing well? It's not fair. They mock and speak in the evil of oppression. They speak loftily. They have set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth saying, therefore his people return here and waters of a filled cup are drained by them. And they have said, how could El know? And is their knowledge in the most high? See, these are the wrong and always at ease. They have amassed wealth. Indeed, in vain, I have cleansed my heart and washed my hands in innocence, for I am plagued all day long, and my reproof is every morning. Have you ever felt, why must I keep going through the refinery? Why am I always being challenged? Why am I always being crushed? Where, where are my blessings, Father? Right? And all these wicked people are going around and things are hunky-dory for them. And the psalmist is saying, why am I doing this? In vain I have cleansed my heart and washed my hands in his innocence. And he's plagued all day long. And his reproof is every... Now, who's reproving him? Like, we know that a father chastises his son. So Yah's reproving him, and he's going, why? What's going on? 
have you ever felt why do i seem to have it harder than others and this could be within the body you know father why are you blessing them and not me why what's going on i've been faithful i've been walking in the integrity of my heart as best as i know how why am i having it harder have you ever felt where is my time to be lifted up where are my blessings because the psalmist was going through this we all go through this again this is not a new thing let's keep going if i had said let me speak thus i would have deceived a generation of your children now what does it mean by let me speak thus let's go back to this indeed i have cleansed in vain i have cleansed my heart and washed my hands and i'm plagued all day long my reproof is every morning and the psalmist is saying you know this is what i'm feeling and if he'd said this he would have actually deceived a generation of children i mean this, he realizes how serious this is now just so you know um the author of this psalm is asaf now asaf would have been a levite and a levite in those days would have been a teacher of israel it would have been a teacher teaching the ways to the people so he realizes you know i'm seeing all this seeming injustice but he needs to watch his words because why he, he he's got the potential to deceive a whole generation of his people yet when i tried to understand this it was labor to my eyes until i went into the set apart place of el then i perceived their end have you ever felt that all this is too much and almost unfair because he did look when i tried to understand this it was labor to me it, 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 it was hard for him to to realize this and to come to and come to heads with this if the psalmist can perceive the end of the wicked this implies he can also perceive his own end he ha it, you can almost sense that he's trying to remind himself of why he's doing this of why he's um of why he is cleansing his heart because at the end of the day he's accountable to yah and nobody else uh, ultimately on judgment day it's between you and the king and he he's almost reminding himself of this fact indeed you set them in slippery places you make them fall to ruins he's speaking of the wicked now how suddenly they are ruined completely swept away through destructions yeah when you awake you despise their image as one does a dream after waking now i've put here that he despises their image so th this has got a, a connotation of idolatry they're not putting yah first they're, they're almost you know thumbing their nose at him and the, the psalmist is saying that they have an image in their heart quite often we forget the end goal of our faith as we get too caught up with our trials and with the now you know so this is what the psalmist was saying asaf he was looking around and seeing all this wickedness and people uh gaining mass uh, uh, gaining wealth and amassing all these riches through unrighteousness and seemingly not being judged for it and he has to remind himself that they will be completely ruined and that yah despises them and we do this all the time we get caught up in our crushing we get caught up in our tribulation and we go oh father why and sometimes we just have to remind ourselves of what the end goal of the faith is i mean what's the end goal of you going through the fire what's the end goal of you being crushed is so that you can be made presentable for him so that you can actually draw near to him if elohim despises the image of the wrong what does he think of those who earnestly seek him again this is where you have to realize okay this is where integrity comes to play like can you honestly say i am seeking you just because you're seeking him doesn't mean you have all the answers either you know there's many things that i've got on my proverbial shelf that i don't know the answer to but I, I i do my best to seek him and i'm i try my best to wait patiently upon him remember elohim is seeking integrity not perfection if you're trying to i've said this so many times and i'll keep saying it 
when we appear before him at the, at the Moedim, we cannot stand before him in perfection, but we can stand before him in integrity. You know, then we can say to the Father, search me, try me, prove me, see that I've done this with all my heart, with all my being, that I've shmarred as best as possible. That's what he wants. For my heart was in a ferment, and I was pierced in my kidneys. Now this verse caught my attention. The King James renders it this way. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reins. And when I see a, a translational difference like that, it always piques my interest. Now the word for grieved or in a ferment right here, this is the word, chametz. Now, those of you who know your Passover, uh, the, chametz is leaven. Here it says to be leavened, to be sour, to be leavened, to taste something leavened, uh, to be embittered, to be grieved. So here, thus my heart was grieved. The verb here is in the hitzpa'el form, and it means to be embittered. Um, it's like, because you've got to remember, how did you make leaven back in the day? You, you let dough go sour. It, you, they did sourdough bread essentially so this is why uh, he says my heart was soured it was soured but it's just amazing like going back to um he the psalmist is remembering you know remember he's complaining about everything why because his heart was leavened i hope people can see that the psalmist is having a crisis of faith and wrestling with Elohim. He's wrestling with the reality of this walk, of this journey. Why? Because his heart was leavened. He was like, he's almost saying this is unfair. His heart was, it, it was puffed up. There was something inside of him that was pre preventing him from seeing the truth of things. This is why he says this earlier. I want to bring these up. Indeed, in vain I have cleansed my heart and washed my hands in innocence. If I had said, let me speak thus, I would have deceived a generation of your children. So he's saying, because if he'd had allowed his leavened heart to infect others, he'd be deceiving everybody else. This is why we have to be really careful with leaven. Yet when I tried to understand this, it was labor to my eyes. Until I went into the set apart place, then I perceived their end. Look, guys, is it fun having the leaven shown in you and then having to deal with it? No, it's labor. It's labor to my eyes. Um, but then it says, look, until I went into the set-apart place of El, then I perceived the, their end. It's like he came to that place of intimacy with Yah and he was able to see clearly. The psalmist wrestled with the leaven in his heart and he overcame. And this is evident from this. Then I perceived their end. He realized the folly he was in. So again, why? Because his heart was chametz. It was leavened. And he was pierced in his kidneys. I was stupid and ignorant. I was like a beast towards you, like an animal. Now, you've got to remember it, 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 in the Hebraic thinking that an animal doesn't have um, higher thought, if that makes sense. You know, we can reason, we can, we can do all these things that animals can't. And he was saying, I, I was just like an animal. I was behaving on impulse. I was, if that makes sense. Have you ever felt angry towards Elohim? Because... You know, I've been there. I know what it feels like. And especially early on in my walk, like it's like you end up sacrificing so much. And sometimes it gets to you. And and I remember, like, it took me a while to realize this, but eventually the father revealed that in me. And I had to go, oh, my goodness, I'm actually angry at you. I've got no reason to, but well, in my flesh, I had reason. You know, I'm having to give up all these things and where are the blessings? And again, everything that the psalmist is saying now, why are those people having it good? And I'm not, why am I being reproved all the time? And it, you know, it, it, it gets to you sometimes, but guess what? I was stupid and ignorant. I was like an animal. I was acting on impulse towards him. 
Have you realized what you looked like when looking back at the situation? I know, I, again, you think, ah, oh, you know, but again, you got to have integrity. You got to have integrity because if you don't admit the problem, you're just going to keep burying it deeper and deeper and deeper. And eventually it will actually, it will destroy you from the inside, but then it will also drive all your, all your actions and decisions. Yet I am always with you. You took hold of my right hand. You led me by your counsel and afterward received me unto, unto your esteem. So even though the psalmist was going through all this, Yah took hold of his right hand. Why? Because the psalmist wrestled with it and he stuck it out. He stuck it out. Now it says, you led me by your counsel and afterwards received me into your esteem. Now, we, we would ultimately, the pasha of this is the word, you know, the counsel of his word. But where else do we get counsel from? I mean, I get great counsel from those I'm in discipleship with. You know, Yah's put these people in my life and I know that he speaks through them to me. You know, these are people with the Ruach of Elohim. And again, th this is one of the ways that I've been led and to make good decisions. It's also one of the ways that my fellow brothers have gone, uh, your heart isn't right on this, Michael. Your heart's not right. But he was leading me by his counsel. Whom do I have in the heavens? And I have desired no one besides you on earth. This is the key to wrestling with our leaven. We must have our eyes and hearts set on him alone. And I've put here, get off the throne. Stop trying to steer it. Stop trying to take matters into your own hands. Because if it's okay to wrestle with things, guys. You know, we, we're all going to come to places where we have these crises of faith. And the key to wrestling through that and coming out the other end is to have a desire for no one else but Elohim. You know, th this is part of the crushing. This is part of the tribulation. My flesh and my heart shall waste away, but Elohim is the rock of my heart and my portion forever. For look, those who are far from you perish. You shall cut off all those who go whoring away from you again link this back to this the psalmist asaf has desired no one else besides yah he's in that that spiritual intimate intimate place and he's not committing spiritual adultery and he's saying that the wrong those who are who shall perish they go whoring away from him now this would apply to as well if you are if you're sat on the throne if you're sat on the throne but as for me it is good to be near elohim i have made my refuge in the master yard to declare all your works i don't know about you guys that psalm just it came to life for me it became real and i realized that what we go through they were going through right there's nothing new under the sun and really is beautifully simple just get the leaven out of your heart but you have to be honest and you have to be able to be willing to even look at it and wrestle with elohim and go to that place where it's uncomfortable and just stick it out psalm 71 in you O yah i've taken refuge leaven let me never be ashamed in your righteousness deliver and rescue me incline your ear to me and save me be to me a rock to dwell in to go into continually you have given the command to save me, for you are my rock and my stronghold. Rescue me, O Elohim, out of the hand of the wrong, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel. Now the word there in cruel, again, is chametz. The word chametz only appears three times in, in, the, in the Tanakh. And this is the second place. May Elohim deliver us from those who are leavened. That's my prayer for all of us, you know, and that would include ourselves. Deliver me from myself, Father. I, am, I have leaven. Deliver me from that. Leaven is highly contagious and dangerous. You know, a little leaven, leaven is the whole lump. Okay, so we've kind of gone on a tangent. Let's bring it back to our Torah portion. 
the kidneys and the fat belong to Elohim and they are to be offered upon his altar. So in Leviticus 2.1, it says, No grain offering which you bring to Yah is made with leaven, for you do not burn any leaven or any honey in an offering to Yah made by fire. Or the, the sacrifices would have had their uh, corresponding grain offerings. And Yah is saying that you do not put leaven in there. If the kidneys represent our innermost being, we must rid the leaven from it if it is to be offered up onto the Elohim. That's the point I'm trying to get at. The heart and the kidneys. Remember, the kidneys belong to Elohim and they're to be offered up with the fat. And the kidneys represent the heart. And we see this, everything we've gone through so far shows that, you know, yeah, judge me. Get the leaven out. See that I've been walking in integrity. Because then that, that, those kidneys, that heart can be offered back unto him leaven free. Most people cannot handle seeing and knowing how truly fallen they are. Thus, they never face their own leaven. And that's, that's just the harsh truth, guys. And I say this because I've, I've experienced this and continue to experience this. In the, in the lead up to every Moedim, Yah shows me something and it's ugly. We've all got the... Like, People don't realize how truly desperately sick their hearts are. You know, we quote this verse, the heart is desperately sick and wicked. Who can know it? Like we don't actually have the guts to truly face up to it. We, we, we push it down. We don't want to look at it. And if you don't look at it, you'll never be able to deal with it. It is this space of repentance that discipleship at the 12 level is reserved for. Walk with a group of men long enough, or a group of ladies if you're a lady, on that intimate space long enough, things will come out. Things will come out. Can you deal with it? Can you deal with it? No one is above the sifting. No one. Not, not, not the congregants, not the leaders. Everybody has to go through it, and everybody will face up to it. This is why I'm very particular as to who I allow into discipleship. Because if you're not willing to walk in that place of taking that social mask off, I haven't got time for that. You know, time is short, as it were. And I want to know that the people, I don't want to waste my efforts. Doesn't mean I don't love people. Most people like the idea of discipleship, but are simply not ready to walk in this space. Again, you know, we get a lot of interest uh, and I get reg fairly regular emails. Oh, could I be part of the discipleship? And it's like, well, are you ready to walk in this almost um, naked place, if that makes sense, where everything is exposed? Messiah died for all, but he could only use 12 disciples as vessels. That's the, So I don't want people to confuse, you know, when I say, there's going to come a point where some of us are going to have to say, I'm sorry, but you're not ready for this. And people automatically go to this place. You're saying I'm not saved. And it's like, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that you're not ready to face 11. You know, Yeshua died for everyone, but he couldn't use everyone like he could the disciples. Why could the disciples be used in the way they were? Because they got rid of that leaven. Their kidneys and their hearts became offerable to the Father. I, I hope people really understand this because, you know, you should have said, come follow me. And then he didn't hang around. It doesn't mean he didn't love everybody else. Um, you know, you sure is, when he says, if you look back from the plow, you're not fit to be my disciples. Is, is he being harsh? Is he saying they're now damned to the lake of fire? That's not what he's saying at all. All he's saying is you're just not ready to go to that place of ridding that leaven. I hope that makes sense. Ah, golden nugget. So I want to, every now and then I like sharing golden nuggets that I've come across. Leviticus 1 2. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When any of you, when any one of you brings an offering to Yah. Now here's the Hebrew. Uh, Adam ki uh, yakriv mikem. Uh, so this is it literally means a man. But this is when any man or any one of you brings of you. Uh, this is karban. This is the offering, la Yehovah. Now, 
Schneur Zalman. He was the first Rebbe of Lubavitch. He points out a grammatical oddity in this verse. By the way, I'm not saying... Um, I'm, this is a non-Messianic source. I'll point that out. But I just found what this guy had to say really interesting in regards to this. He points out a grammatical oddity in this verse. For the phrase, when any one of you brings an offering, so this bit here, um, when anyone brings, if you, when any one of you brings an offering, one would expect the word order to be this, Adam Mikem Ki Yakriv. So notice that this, this section and this section are the other way round. However, the Hebrew is written as above. And when you translate it literally, it means when anyone brings an offering of you to Yah. So this idea that the offering is of you, which is really interesting. And he goes on to say, the essence of sacrifice is that we offer ourselves. We bring to God our faculties, our energies, our thoughts and emotions. The physical form of sacrifice, an animal offered on the altar, is only an external manifestation of an inner act. The real sacrifice is mikem, of you. We give God something of ourselves. And I, I find this is amazing because this is a non-Messianic source saying this. And, and Paul will say that you are to be a living sacrifice, set apart, holy. Um, I, I just found that really interesting. I hope you guys do too. Okay, moving forward, Leviticus 5. Um, and when, any, when a being sins in that he has heard the voice of swearing and is a witness or has seen or has known but does not reveal it, he shall bear his crookedness. Or when a being touches any unclean matter, or the carcass of an unclean beast, or the carcass of unclean livestock, or the carcass of unclean creeping creatures, and it has been hidden from him, he is unclean and guilty. Or when he touches the uncleanness of a man, any of his uncleanness by which he is clean, and it has been hidden from him, when he shall know it, then he shall be guilty. Or when a being swears, speaking rashly with his lips to do evil or to do good, whatever it is a man swears rashly with an oath, and it has been hidden from him, when he shall know it, then he shall be guilty of one of these. And it shall be when he is guilty of one of these, that he shall confess that in which he has sinned, and shall bring his guilt offering to Yah for his sin, which he has sinned, a female from the flock, a lamb or a female for goat, as a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for him for his sin. And if he is unable to bring a lamb, then he shall bring to Yah, he who has sinned, two turtle doves or two young pigeons, one for a sin offering and the other for an ascending offering. But if he is unable to bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, then he who has sinned shall bring for his offering one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour as a sin offering. He puts no oil on it, he, nor does he put any frankincense on it, for it is a sin offering. We see in these instances... Provision is made for those of different social classes. So it didn't matter whether you're rich, poor, or, or in between. You could bring something to help atone for that sin. Now notice that these sins are either against oneself or against your fellow man. Let's quickly go back. When a being swears, uh, the other one was hearing the voice of swearing, touching an unclean matter, or touching a, uh, the uncleanness. So all these sins are to do either with yourself or with your fellow man. Now let's keep going. When a being commits a trespass and has sinned by mistake against the set-apart matters of Yah, so now this is against things of the covenant, then he shall bring to Yah as his guilt offering a ram, a perfect one from the flock, with your valuation in shekels of silver, according to the shekel of the set-apart place as a guilt offering. And when any being sins and has done what is not to be done against any of the commands of Yah, Though he knew it not, yet he shall be guilty and shall bear his crookedness. Then he shall bring to the priest a ram, a perfect one, from the flock, with your valuation as a guilt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for his mistake he committed unintentionally, though he did not know it, and it shall be forgiven him. It is a guilt offering he was truly guilty before Yah. These latter sins are towards Elohim, 
whereas the previous set of sins are towards your fellow man. Now it would seem that in regards to trespasses and sins against the commands of Elohim, everybody has to bring the same offering. This is something that I'd never realized before until going through it this time, that um, with sins in regards to swearing or uncleanness, there was a, you're, you're allowed to bring different grades of offering depending on how, um, how rich or poor you were. Now, when it, comes to the, um, when it comes to things in regards to Elohim, I don't see any other provisions being made, which is really interesting. I believe this teaches us the concept that Elohim is no respecter of persons and that the penalty for sin is the same for all. This is why the offering for it has to be the same for all. There's also an interesting point in regards to offerings of a ruler and the layperson. So again, we're talking about uh, sin offerings here. Remember, there, were t there, were the, there was the ascending or the burnt offering, there was the grain offering, and there was the peace offering. And then there were two different uh, sin offerings. Uh, one's the guilt and one's the trespass. When a ruler sins and by mistake has done against any of the commands of Yah, his Elohim, which are not to be done and shall be guilty. So again, this is against the commands of Yah. Or if his sin which he has sinned is made known to him, then he shall bring his offering a buck of the goats, a male, a perfect one. And if any, so this is what it is for the ruler. Now notice it's a goat and a male. Now, if I'm not mistaken, um, I just want to check something. There you go. So in, in this case, the trespass is, it's a ram, a ram for everybody, a ram. So let's go back to, so for the ruler, it's a buck of the goats and it has to be a male goat. And if any being of the people of the land sins by mistake, by doing against any of the commands of Yah, which are not to be done and shall be guilty, or if his sin which he has sinned shall be made known to him, then he shall bring as his offering a female goat, a perfect one for his sin which he has sinned. I believe that the respective offerings for the ruler and the layperson point to the design of headship and specifically that of marriage. Why do I say that? A ruler brought a male goat while a layperson brought a female goat. Just as the husband is the head of the wife, so a ruler is the head of those he rules over. So what, what I'm essentially saying is that you've got male goat, female goat. You've got the ruler being the male, presenting a male offering, and you've got the people presenting a female offering. So you can see this design of headship. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so let's look at the, the other parties. And if the entire congregation of Israel strays by mistake and the matter has been hidden from the eyes of the assembly and they have done against any of the commands of Yah which are not to be done and shall be guilty, and when the sin which they have sinned becomes known, then the assembly shall bring a young bull for the sin and bring it before the tent of the appointment. A greater sin requires a greater offering. This is the whole congregation now. Now, remember, a bull back then uh, is the equivalent of your combine harvester. It's your tractor. You know, this is what they plowed the fields with. These were expensive. Now, if the anointed priest sins, bringing guilt on the people, notice that if the priest sins, it brings guilt on the people, then he shall bring to Yah for his sin, which he has sinned, a young bull, a perfect one, as a sin offering. If the priest sins, it's as if the whole congregation has sinned. And notice that the priest has to bring a higher grade offering than what the ruler does. The ruler had to bring a male goat. The priest has to bring a bull. Again, these, like we just think, oh yeah, just a cow. Like back then, this was a lot of money. You didn't just, not everybody could afford a bull. Now, why is it that uh, if the priest sins, it's, the whole, it's as if the whole congregation has sinned? Uh, scripture actually elucidates on this quite clearly. This is speaking of the priests in uh, the millennial reign, actually, in Ezekiel 44. And they are to teach my people the difference between the set apart and the profane and make them know what is unclean and clean. 
and they are to stand as judges in a dispute and to judge it accordingly to my, according to my right rulings. And they are to guard my Torah and my laws in all my appointed times and set apart my Sabbaths. Look, you can see what the duty of a priest is here. They're, they're to teach the people. In Leviticus 10, and Yah spoke to Aharon, saying, do not drink wine or strong drink, you nor your sons with you when you go into the tent of appointment, lest you die, a law forever throughout your generations, so as to make a distinction between the set apart and the profane and between the unclean and the clean. Now notice that this do not drink wine is to help them make a distinction between the set apart and the profane. And to teach the children of Israel all the laws which Yah has spoken to them by the hand of Moshe. When our judgment is clouded by wine. Now, Hebraically, wine represents teaching. This is what the parable of the wineskins is all about. If, imagine if your judgment is clouded by wine. It affects our ability to judge between what is right and wrong. Now, if you do a study on... Uh, like the false prophets. Uh, in, in Isaiah 29, around uh, in Isaiah and Jeremiah, he says that uh, it's as if the prophets uh, are, are on wine and strong drink. They, they're, they're, and the wine and strong drink is actually alluding to delusion. They are deluded. It's, uh, it's you know, that spiritual thing where, you know, wine, uh, Yah sends a strong delusion. Now, if a priest is clouded by delusion. If a priest is listening to the wrong voice, it's actually going to affect his ability to judge between what is right and wrong. So a really easy example is the delusion that the Torah no longer stands. If, if you haven't got a Torah, you do not have a definition of sin. If you do not have a Torah, you will, you will not be able to know the difference between right and wrong. I hope that makes sense. So again, I love the imagery here. You know, do not drink wine or strong drink. Keep yourselves mentally sober. You know, do not listen to delusion. Deuteronomy 33. And of Levi, he said, they teach your right rulings to Yaakov and your Torah to Yisrael. And they put incense before you in a complete and a complete ascending offering on your slaughter place. Now, if the priest is defiled and he's walking around in the tabernacle, and do, what will this do? Yah says that the reason he has all these rules, especially to do with uncleanness, is so that he can dwell in our midst. So, because the priests are all, they were always in these set apart places, they had to have a higher level of being set apart because of how, you know, the average person didn't go into the tabernacle. It was only the priest. So the priest had to keep himself to a higher account. Malachi 2. This is, again, speaking of, uh, of uh, Levi. The Torah of truth was in his mouth, and unrighteousness was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and straightness, and turned many away from crookedness. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and they seek the Torah from his mouth, for he is the messenger of Yah of hosts. So again, this is why it's especially important that the priest remains set apart. And this is why if a priest sins, he has to offer up the highest level of offering because he is the messenger of Yah of hosts. He, he's essentially, I've said before that our very actions bear witness of who we serve. And by being hypocrites and by being unrighteous, we bear false witness of what it means to be a child of Yah, even more so for the priest even more so. But you, this is speaking to the priests in Malachi's day, you have turned away from the way. You have caused many to stumble in the Torah. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, said Yah of hosts. Why? Because they sinned. They, their hearts became leavened. Read the whole of Malachi and you'll see what they were doing. I hope that's been a blessing, guys. Um, you know, I would like to say pray for your leaders. 
um, and those that walk in a quote unquote priestly function, um, you know, that because that they receive a harsher judgment. And sometimes I feel that, you know, I, I've been in that place that Asaf was saying in Psalm 73, like, why father, why are you doing this? Why am I being crushed? And da, da, da. anyway, um, I hope it's been a blessing as well, especially Psalm 73 in that, look guys, it's okay to wrestle. It's okay, especially now leading up to unleavened bread and the father's turning up the heat and the father's showing these things in your heart. It's okay to wrestle. All I would say is hang in there. Keep your eyes on Yah. Stay in fellowship with those who truly seek Yah. Because the crime is not having the leaven. The crime is not dealing with it. It's a given. We are, sin we are sinful. We are leavened. It's a given. It doesn't surprise you. But what he wants us is to actually, we, we need to have the courage to face it, guys. We really do. And, you know, people be there for each other. And do not be afraid to to almost uncover yourself in front of someone that you, um, that you really trust. And I'm talking in the spiritual sense here, you know, it's okay. Take off that social mask, be you and let the father refine you. And for those that are being crushed, you know, let your brothers and your sisters support you in this. Amen.